Radio service is a radio service that, that basically invented radio. Back in the early 1900s to 1920s, there was no licensing on radio. People that were communicating between ships were using uh, you know, what we call spark gap technology. And people would go and build their own radio networks and build them up and do them. Matter of fact, the first uh, Radio network in the United States was, was called the Amateur American Amateur uh, Radio Relay League, ARRL, and they were limited at very very low frequency, below 500 kilohertz, and they could only transmit so many hundred miles. So they had groups all across the United States that would relay messages across back and forth and all that. Now, why would you want to get in the amateur radio service? You can be licensed with a simple 35 question multiple choice test. You get all the answers to the question pool before you get them. Number two, you have the greatest spectrum available for personal use. You can go all the way through Skyway, uh, worldwide communications frequencies, and you can put on a, a radio station talk all over the world for under $500 if you take a little time effort. You can also go through the microwave region. So this spectrum that's available for use is available once you get your license. It can't be used for business purposes. You can't use, uh, uh, you can't broadcast music. You can't transmit obscene content. There's some strictures to it, you know, even though if you listen to 75 meters, you would realize it. That rule's largely ignored. Um, and for the, for the bank for the buck, $14, a little bit of preparation, you get your technician license. That gives you use of all frequencies of about 30 megahertz in the VHS, VHS, and microwave spectrum, plus limited use of frequencies in the HS spectrum. And historically, amateur radios provided disaster communications where normal communications have failed. Um, everybody heard of the National Hurricane Net? Watch Net? Yeah. Okay, down in uh, the Caribbean islands and all that. Make sure I'm I have to go pretty quick here. Uh, Caribbean islands and such where everything's wiped out, but there's a hammer and yard group. Well, you know, these are the people that have made this their job. This is what they do for fun. They like to be able to be on the air when nobody else is. So it's a great group of people to get involved with, uh, as long as you find the ones that have taken their back. <laughs> <laughs> there's a certain group type of amateur radio operator that has some grooming issues. But you find that just about any kind of group, okay? Bikers and anything. So, amateur radio provides you enormous flexibility in frequencies and, and equipment. And you don't have to do much to get on any frequencies you want to do as long as you're not interfering with somebody else. There's some restrictions on repeaters because of the agreements, but there's no licensing involved in licensed repeater stations. Amateur operators are cheap, aren't they? How cheap are amateur radio operators? They're real cheap. So they like to do things on the budget. You know, they like to improvise. They like to take this part and that part, put it together, and see how it works. They're experimenters. They like to, to come up with solutions with what they have on hand and the minimum amount of effort. So they kind of sound like the kinds of things that survival people want to do or preparedness people want to do. Okay, the neat thing about it, you can use emission types that go from Code. Everybody remember Independence Day? How did we defeat the aliens? How did they get the message out to the rest of the world? Morse code. Why? It's simple. It's an arcane uh, method of communication. It's highly effective. It works when nothing else works. Not everybody likes to do it. You don't have to know code to get your license now. But some people get their license and they learn it and enjoy it. And uh, if you can't do anything else, you can build a code transmitter from hand. You can take an old radio in your house and build a transmitter out of it if you have a little bit of knowledge after working with radio for a few years. Soon complex set of the art bandwidth data transmissions. You can build your own mesh networking networks, TCP IP networks, and amateur radio using amateur radio frequencies. So there's really no limit depending on the amount of, of uh, expertise that you can leverage and put into it. There's some limitations. You can't run encryption. There's one exception, that's the telecommand to amateur satellites. There are satellites that amateurs put up and use to communicate from space to Earth and back and forth. 
but you can talk to a satellite and encrypt your telecommand messages to that. You can't use content meant to obscure the meaning or identity communication, so you have to use your call signs once every 10 minutes. But people use ham radio to talk about, well, I'm going to location one, or I'm going to my destination. There's ways around talk about what you're talking about that you don't have to pull by everything. I know I like to listen in and try to figure out what's going on sometimes, so I, I'm kind of stupid and I like to listen in on radio. Uh, newer technologies from public designs may bid the identification of emissions. That means if you have a D-Star radio like this, which is an amateur version of uh, the newer digital emission protocols, it just sounds like noise when you're uh, You don't have to say your voice on there to say you are. It's just identified by the emission. So that means that only these kind of radios really know who it is. That's kind of a neat thing when you're, when you're uh, trying to send data and stuff like that. And here, here's the real gem of this whole thing. Amateur radio provides the greatest flexibility and planning and capability for most cases of personal disaster communication. You're going to find other hands that are interested. Your own group, you don't have to coordinate with other amateur radios if you don't want to, operators. You can coordinate within your own group. If y'all have the licensing and the radio equipment, you can come up with a solution of what you're going to do you're in a, after a collapse or during a disaster or at your homestead or whatever you're going to do. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about more and start getting some questions. Do you have to set up one of those home towers? Don't have to be. No. But sometimes being higher up helps the radio signaling when you're trying to go out on distance. So um, it's, you know, that's the real magic is you can take a three or four or five hundred dollar amateur transceiver, a shortwave transceiver, a little antenna tuner and a wire. And you go out to a park and run a wire up and you can tune that wire and you can talk all the world on it. You don't have to have a big tower. Big tower is nice because you can direct your signal in a certain uh, direction and that kind of thing. And But it also attracts attention to the fact that you have a radio system as well. How about loading up a metal chair on 20 meters? I've, I've done that. I've done fences. And I've also put antennas that were like 18 inches off the ground. Again, yeah, 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 there's all kinds of things you can do to make antenna systems work on, on high frequency. And that's what I'm talking about. Amateur radio systems may include repeater and interconnected network to expand area coverage. Now, I'm going to show you a thing about a repeater. All a repeater is is a station you put up high, it hears somebody at a distance come in or nearby, enters in, and it's retransmitted out of it. So the higher up your repeater station is, the more likely someone else can work it at a distance. It's also more likely somebody can hear it too. So it's kind of a dual edged sword there if you're concerned about not trying to hide your content, but maybe not broadcasting what you're doing. And um, HF, shortwave spectrum, provides Skywave. Anybody know what Skywave is? Skywave is the ionosphere, what parts blasting, as you talked about on the show that I was on. And that's where instead of a, a mountaintop, your signals go up to the ionosphere and they bounce back down again. Mm -hmm. And depending on the type of antenna systems, the frequency, the time of day, and the sunspot cycle, you can communicate in a, in a region, nationally or globally, using just HF spectrum. You don't need any other infrastructure at all. Just this right here gives you the capability of talking in a regional area over three or three or four hundred miles. Yep, cloud cover doesn't affect it. Atmospheric noise does. If you've got thunderstorms and all that, and you're using single sideband or AM modulation, you're going to hear, but you've got noise blankers that help mitigate that. The frequency agile nature, what does that mean? That means that when you buy an amateur transceiver, it's got a front dial, and it's got a keypad. Where do you want to talk? You put in the frequency, bang, you put it in the channel. Wait a minute. I'm, somebody's on that one. I go to that channel. In just a two meter band, there's over 800 channels. Now you got a FRS radio like you bought, you got 14, maybe 22 channels. So you have all kinds of spectrum you can go to and program with radio. You can find a spot to put your communication. So the fact that you can choose your channel, you're not restricted to a certain channel, is a real powerful thing. That lets you uh, develop frequency planning and networks that you can put um, uh, communications groups together. 
surplus equipment from military commercial providers. Remember that narrow band out thing I was talking about earlier, where they're forcing people to buy newer equipment that takes up. There's a lot of uh, police and, and uh, mostly police and public service equipment that are surplus now. You can buy dirt cheap. You can buy a, a, a Motorola and other manufacturers' equipment now at about 20 and tenth of the cost. Now that does come with a price though, the surplus equipment. It's good equipment, it's hard, but you have to program it. As a general rule, it's not programmable. So that means you gotta license the software from Motorola if it's still available. If it's not available on Motorola, doesn't really care that much about uh, the older, like the RSS, but the Sabres, the older series. But you can buy really rugged, well-built equipment for pennies on the dollar. You do have to have the the expertise to learn how to program and stuff. That's one of the links I have in my handout for that too. Any questions on amateur radio service so far? Yes. 